Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our virtual field trip series that we've been doing on Fridays. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us today. I'm Mary Wilson with the Alabama Farmers Federation. And to start, um, one thing that we would love for you guys to do is in the comments, share where you're watching us from. So um, city and state, because it's very fun for our farmers and today our educator to know how far these virtual field trips are reaching. So even if you're watching this after the fact, um, please comment and let us know where you're from because we've reached California and Idaho and Virginia and um, lots of places all over the state of Alabama as well. So today we're going to be talking about honeybees with a visit to a backyard hive, but I do want to um, share something from last week's virtual field trip. We visited with um, Tabor and Grace Ellis to talk about beef cattle, and we had um, this great picture sent in to us. This uh, nice young lady here did um, colored in the coloring page that we had for beef cattle. So we do also have a coloring page for um, the honeybees. So thanks for um, them sending that in. And uh, we, we learned she's actually from Colorado. So that's, that's kind of cool to have somebody from Colorado. And if you look at the links right now, we've got a coloring page up there for you already. You can print this out and color it in and then um, share that on social media and tag us. If you're on Facebook, when you share it, um, just do an at Alabama Farmers. And if you're on Instagram sharing it, you can share with at Alpha Farmers. All right, also um, along with putting in your hometown in the comments, um, if you have any questions about honeybees, you can go ahead and start asking those and we'll pull those up later after um, Jeff goes through a little bit of what he's gonna say. But now it is time to move on to our main event. So we're very excited to have Jeff Williams with us today. He is from Auburn University's Bee Lab. So everybody say hi to Jeff. And uh, he's gonna provide us a little bit of background on honeybees and also show us his backyard hive. Um, and then we'll get to the questions after all that. So Jeff, it's your turn. Take it away, man. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? So welcome to my backyard. Um, believe it or not, there is such a thing as a bee lab at Auburn University, but just because uh, of our recent situation with COVID-19, I, like most other people, are working from home. So I wanted to wanted to invite you to my backyard to see and talk about some bees. So hopefully everyone's doing well and um, still wearing their sweatpants at home. You know, this is the first time in probably six weeks that I'm not wearing sweatpants right now. So I'm just like you all. Yeah, here's my fancy bee clothes. So yeah, we're here to talk about honeybees and um, the importance of honeybees I wanted to start off with. And most of you probably know that honeybees are really important for producing honey. This is this natural sweetener. And here's a really neat um, honey that I got from one of my friends in Thailand, actually. So this honey was collected from coffee. So coffee flowers can also produce, ne produce nectar. So, you know, everyone thinks about uh, honey with the honeybee. And of course, like every other honey, this one's super tasty. Mm, I hope I don't have too much in my mouth there. So another thing that's really important about honeybees and probably the most important is that honeybees help produce many of our fruits and vegetables and nuts that we eat. And so there's some really great examples, both from down here in the Southeast, like Alabama, where I live, um, but across the entire country. So most famous, are the almonds. So almonds rely on 100% pollination. So that's movement of a pollen grain from one flower to another from honeybees. So yeah, when you eat a when you eat an almond nut, um, yeah, it's it's because of the honeybee. Super tasty also. We also have strawberries, also rely on honeybees. Hold on, I gotta eat my almond first. <laughs> Yummy. And We've got blueberries. So blueberries and other fruits are also um, pollinated by other bees. There's thousands of other bees out there. Um, most famous in the Southeast is the South, Southeastern blueberry bee. And so it's really important for pollinating blueberries here in the area, but honeybees do that too. All right, my mouth is completely full now. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. Um, 
talking about bees. And so at the Bee Lab, um, just like other um, labs and universities across the country, we're trying to promote the health of honeybees. And one way we can do that is to promote um, beekeepers and their management of honeybee colonies. So a beekeeper is really important for honeybees. They have to care for um, honeybees just like any other livestock or agricultural animal or even like your pet dog or cat that you may have at home. They really rely on humans like us. Um, many of you are, are probably aware and have heard a lot about the protective gear that we're all needing to wear now. Like, for example, our cloth masks if we go to get groceries. Well, beekeepers also have protective clothing that I wanted to share uh, a little information about. So first and foremost, something called the hive tool. So this is really important and helps us basically inspect the colonies without crushing too many bees. We can manipulate what are called frames in those colonies. And I'll show you a frame in a few minutes here. So we've got that. We have our full length uh, suits um, going all the way to our to our ankles and to our wrist to protect us from sting. So honeybees don't generally um, want to sting you, but they do that to guard their nest and to guard their resources, which is all that honey that we like to eat and they also like to eat. We also have something called a smoker. So this is a really cool contraption. So what we do here is we can burn stuff. Usually in the Southeast, we burn pine straw, but we can also burn um, straw. And we do that to basically distract the bees. So this, we believe, is a natural um, behavior to smoke. So when bees, when bees encounter smoke, they think there might be a forest fire or something. So bees traditionally or historically used to live in cavities of trees. So when they sense that smoke, they get distracted. They move away from me, the beekeeper in this case, and they go and start feeding on the honey. So they're really just like gorging themselves on their prize resource so that in case they have to leave their their um, tree cavity um, they can with a lot of energy so the smoker is really important for distracting um, the honeybee and then finally also most important is our hat and veil so um, it definitely does not uh, it's not fun to be stung particularly to be stung on the face you know if you get stung near the eye it can be quite dangerous um, and your eyes can poof up and you can't see anything and you're walking kind of like a zombie out there. So we really want to put our veil and hat on. So here I go with mine. Um, yeah, how do I look? So there's all kinds of funky suits out there for humans as well as animals because animals play an important role for moving colonies too in some areas. So here in the U.S., we can have upwards of 700 colonies on the back of a tractor trailer. Well, in other places, they may use mules and horses to also transport colonies from crop to crop. And in that case, you know, the donkey needs a bee suit too. All right, so now we're ready. We've got our protective gear. I'm gonna put on some gloves here. The honeybee colony, as you can imagine, is pretty sticky. So I'm gonna put some gloves on. Um, it also helps, um, helps me protect from the stings, but I can also feel the bees a little bit when I have my gloves on. All right, so, all right, this is top secret. Don't tell my neighbors, but we have a secret colony in my backyard. Come with me. So first off, when I first um, visit a colony, I give it a few puffs of smoke. And so again, this is to calm, calm the bees and make sure they're all ready and friendly for me to, for me to visit. Ooh, got some smoke in the eyes. So that's a bad example of how I should be using that smoker so don't follow me all right so I played around with this colony a little bit just to see what's going on in here um, one of our students brought this over to me um, a couple days ago so what you see here this wooden where we call it this wooden box that's actually the hive so the hive is the house of the bees and the colony is what's inside of it so the living creatures inside of this hive so there's three types of bees within a honeybee colony there's two types of females and one type male so the most famous female is the queen and there's usually only one queen in the colony and so what she does there she is actually you can see her we've uh, marked her with blue that means she was born last year 
So hopefully you can see that. So the queen is the most important individual in that colony. She's laying eggs all the time. Um, she's producing pheromones to promote colony cohesion. And surrounding her, you can see some workers. So these are the other type of females. So they don't lay eggs. What they do are all the housekeeping tasks of the colony. So they'll clean the colony. They'll remove um, detritus. They'll care for developing bees. So they'll feed developing bees. And near the end of their life, they're the ones that are going out and foraging, collecting pollen and nectar. So there's our queen. That's pretty cool that we can see her. Sometimes it's pretty difficult to see the queen. And in those cases, um, a beekeeper would look for eggs. And essentially they look like tiny grains of rice at the bottom of a cell. So honey, honeybees build these hexagonal cells using wax glands. And so within these hexagonal cells, they store their developing bees and they store their food. So they're developing bees, just like kind of like a monarch butterfly, they go through these different phases. They have an egg, they have a larva that looks like a little caterpillar. Then they have a, a pupa that looks like a little alien and then they have an adult. So they have these dramatic phase shifts as they're developing. So let's go, we have to be very careful about this frame because the queen's there. But we're gonna go and pick up another frame all right, so I'm using my hive tool to manipulate these frames. And so these frames were basically an invention by a beekeeper and actually a, a member of the church hundreds of years ago. His name was Langstroth. His last name was Langstroth. And so he came up with this concept of bee space where he could separate these frames a certain distance and then it would allow us as beekeepers to remove these frames really easily without the beekeepers all gunking it up. So in this frame, you can see there's a lot of pollen. So the bees are bringing back pollen to the nest and that's the protein source. You know, so that's how they build all their muscles. On the edge of the frame, the bees are storing honey. So in some cases, the honey is um, uncapped as we would say. So you can actually see it when you're looking above. So that means they're still dehydrating that nectar from a flower. So um, that water content from nectar can go from 60% all the way down to about 17, 18% for the honey that we eat as well as the bees eat. So once it reaches that low moisture content, they cap it with another wax layer. And this is what you'd see here. So this is the honey that we would be eating as humans. So this is called a food frame, we would say. So there's a lot of honey, a lot of pollen on there. There's all that stored honey that the beekeepers are, are saving up for periods when there's no flowers out there. So for example, in Alabama here, they'd be saving that up for the middle of the summer as well as in the winter. So let's pull up one more frame here. So I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a brood frame. And so that means that that's where all the developing bees are. So under all of these cappings here is where you would see those pupa that look like aliens. So I'm not sure you'll be able to see that, but I can uncap one of these cells and you'll see the developing bees inside. So the other bee I haven't mentioned is a drone bee. So here's one right here. This is the male bee. So this is the only type of male. There's only one type of male. And so in fact, we have a drone petting zoo when we go do public events. And so um, everyone, uh, little kids, adults, they can test their might and they can hang out with a drone in their hand. Well, it's kind of a, a, a top secret thing that actually drones don't have any stinger. So they won't hurt you. They can't sting you at all. So yeah, there's a drone bee. All righty. So that's what a honeybee colony looks like uh, in my backyard. But there's honeybee colonies all over the country right now. They may be pollinating crops. They may be collecting honey. Lots of clover out. We've had a nice spring. So um, I'm, I'm anticipating a lot of honey being produced here in, here in Alabama where I'm living right now. So we have to carefully put the colony back together. It's really sticky. There's honey. There's something called um, propolis there, which is essentially like a, a plant resin that the bees use to 
glue everything together and protect themselves. All right, actually, I'm going to switch out frames here to make sure our queen gets back in. So you always have to be careful double checking everything. Just like your homework, we got to double check um, putting together a colony properly. And our queen, again, is super important. And so, in fact, I noticed that she walked off that frame. So I'm going to have to pick her up here with my fingers to be very careful. So there's the queen. I've got her in my hand. Super careful. And hopefully, she walks right back down. There she goes. Now she's nice and safe. I'm just going to put these here for now. These are temporary spacers. And we close up our, our colony. So it's really important, you know, to make sure everything is set. Your colony is nicely tucked away. Your smoker is out. Um, we have this container here to prevent um, our smoker catching fire. It's really important. Um, and then do any cleanups. And then we close up shop. All right, so hope everyone enjoyed that little tour, and I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes to answer any questions that you may have. Jeff, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that. We do have a few questions that have come in. Um, let me see. Uh, first, we have this question from uh, Katie. She's wondering about your brave videographer and whether or not she's wearing a suit. <laughs> She is wearing a suit. So it's it's my wife there, Dr. Rogers. There she is. I've also got her head to tail in a suit too. So she's very well protected. Perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. We have another question um, from Kelly, or actually from Ian. Um, and they're wondering, how many bees do you have? Um. So... That's a difficult question to ask. First off, how many individual bees, for example, in that colony, there's probably about 10, 15, 20,000 individual bees in that one colony. Really strong colonies could have, could have upwards of 50 to 60,000 um, bees inside, mainly workers. The workers are the predominant, um, like numerically uh, predominant individual in that colony. How many colonies we have is also an interesting question. Um, we've got about, I would say, 70 to 90 colonies at the Auburn Bee Lab that we're caring for, and we're primarily using them for outreach and extension and research purposes. We've got them scattered around uh, Auburn. All right, fantastic. Now, um, we we had another question, and I'm, I'm having some trouble finding it to actually pull it up on the screen, but I know it was from uh, Lacey Richardson, and they're wondering... Um, how, where do the bees get the wax? So what, what are they collecting from to actually uh, put everything that they have, that they put into the hive? So the wax is actually a glandular secretion that's produced by glands under their abdomen. So basically like their belly. Um, so to get the energy to produce that wax, they have to go out and collect a lot of nectar. So the nectar is the carbohydrate. That's the energy source. So it's really important for the bees to go out there, collect a lot of nectar. That's really important why we should have a lot of floral resources out there um, for our bees, um, not only just honeybees, but bees in general, um, because that's the carbohydrate source that they use to produce the wax that they can make their cells that then they can store their brood um, and food. All right, fantastic. So we, we've had lots of questions come in here in the last little bit too. So um, uh, obviously people are very interested in this topic. Let's see, um, we have a question from Rachel and her daughter wants to know if queen bees have stingers. They do have a stinger, but the stinger in the queen bee is different than the worker and that it's not barbed. So it doesn't have this like jagged little spike coming back on it. So. That's why when you get stung or if you happen to get stung by a worker honeybee, the worker will leave, um, but the stinger will remain. So in the queen bee, they don't have this large barb stinger. So if you happen to be stung by a queen, which is super rare, it wouldn't um, jab into you. And the reason why the queen has a stinger um, still is because she is defending herself against other queens. So when new queens emerge, they will actually battle royale to the death 
and one queen will emerge and take over that colony. And so the stinger is actually a modified ovipositor that's also found only in females. So this is where eggs are sort of laid out of the back end of the of the worker or the queen bee. So that's why the males don't have this um, device because they're not laying eggs. Whoops, that's very interesting, Jeff. And all right, we're just going to keep moving down through these questions because there's a whole bunch. Um, from Amy, do you check the colony every day or once a day? How often do you have to check them? So um, the inquisitive minds who really want to watch their bees will sometimes go too much. And I would say every day would be a bad idea because we need to let the bees sort of rest in peace for some time too. So normally we're checking, I would say every seven um, to 14 days in the spring, um, particularly um, when there's a lot of flowers out there because the colonies actually want to do a lot of things and we just have to keep an eye on them. Um, but uh, in other times of year, like in the summer or in the winter, we may only look at them once a month or even less. So it really depends on the, on the time of year. But unless you have to do something very specific, I would suggest to not check your colony too often. So yeah, maybe once a week or every two weeks would be, would be fine. All right. Um, from Stephanie, she's wondering um, what is the suggested like distance away from a house or a living area um, for for a colony? So that's a little bit tricky. I would definitely say you want to keep as far distance as possible, particularly from your neighbors. Um, so in our case here, maybe our colonies are about, ooh, I would say maybe 40 feet from our house. I have positioned them in a, in a certain way that promotes the bees flying up. So notice they're behind this bush here. So it's really important that you have bees flying up when they're in a residential area. So they're not flying like directly into a path of someone walking their dog, for example, or us coming back and forth through our gate. So you do want to position it a little bit. You probably also want to have some etiquette to notify your neighbor. So um, I did tell my neighbor next door and they're okay with it actually. Um, uh, his father has bees, so I think he was pretty happy to have them. Um, I'll give a, a shout out to the Shaws there. Um, shh, don't tell anyone else though, please. Um, so <laughs> we'll yeah. keep it on the down low. No, no one else knows aside from the hundred people watching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And another question is from uh, Valerie Jones. She's wondering if you harvest the honey and if so, how do you harvest the honey? So we do harvest the honey. So here in Alabama, particularly uh, East Central Alabama, what we're doing is we're harvesting about two times per year. So we're doing that um, middle of May and usually the beginning of July. And this is times when the peak honey flows are occurring and sometimes there's a shift in honey flows from different plants so we're doing it in the spring twice um, we usually finish up that um, that harvesting in early july after chinese tallow which is actually a very invasive plant um, not particularly great for our, our environment and conservation but it's actually a, a really important honey producing plant so beekeepers do benefit from that chinese tallow as well as the the colonies themselves they produce a lot of nectar and so essentially what we do is we take one of those frames, we'll scrape away the top wax capping and we'll put it in something called an extractor. So it essentially spins like a centrifuge all the honey out of that frame and we collect it in a basin below. And that's pretty much it. Um, from a very simplistic like backyard perspective, um, you can eat that honey right out of that frame and it's perfectly fine. And actually even better because there's some pollen and stuff in there. Oh, sounds wonderful. I know, uh, of course, honey is a is a very favorite um, sweetener and just kind of a treat to eat on its own. So uh, lots, lots of folks enjoy honeybees for that reason. Um, we've got a question from Reggie. He's actually wondering, just for you personally, what do you love most about bees? Hmm. Yeah, I can't even say one thing. I think it's just so fascinating. Like, when you pull up that frame and you just see like that organization and all the things the bees are doing in uniform, that's really amazing. And then sometimes you get a treat and you'll see them do their little waggle dance. And yeah, there's just so many interesting things to see all in like the space of a few minutes and in, in just a tiny uh, confine of that colony. Very cool. All right. Um, from Rachel, um, or, or from Sophia, Rachel's daughter, do the bees' habits change in the winter? They do a little bit. So not only do the bees change internally, but externally in terms of their behavior, they also change. So in the winter, um, they basically, just like us, 
they just hang out. Well, actually, I'm from Canada. So in the wintertime, we just hang out inside all the time. Well, the bees are actually doing that too in wintertime. So um, yeah, they've, they're basically living off of all the nectar stores that they've um, kept and are uh, holding inside their colony. And so they'll essentially hang out during the wintertime. Here in Alabama, they do fly from time to time. But in more northern areas, they may hang out in their colony for three, four, even five months. All right, I think we have time for maybe just two more questions. So this one okay. is from Cadence. He's uh, eight, eight years old, wondering how long does the average bee live? So that really depends on the type of bee. So the worker bee, for example, once she will emerge from her cell, she'll live for about three weeks within the colony doing all the housekeeping duties. And then she'll live another two to three weeks going back and forth to flowers, collecting all their food. So the bees, the worker bee will live about six weeks. The queen, on the other hand, can live for several years. Um, that's one thing that beekeepers are noting is that queens aren't living as long. So that's one thing that um, us at Auburn University are doing. We're researching the health of queens, but queen bees can live for several years um, for sure. And then the drones, they typically will live um, a few weeks, just like a work or two. Wow, so some some short lifespans in there, but they're also producing lots of lots of new bees to replace yep. them. So, all yeah, right, our very uh, the queen could, oh. the queen could be uh, laying upwards of one thousand eggs per day. Oh wow, okay, yeah, that is that's a lot of bees. Um, so our last question is going to be from um, Carrie Babcock or from Caroline, I'm sorry, the, the parents are sending in the questions and then the child's <laughs> name is in the comments. So that's why I keep messing that up. My bad, you guys. But from Caroline, where do you actually get your bees to put them in hives? So we get our bees from really trusted uh, beekeepers around the area. So we've got a few beekeepers that will buy bees from. So you can buy bees. They can actually show up in the mail, believe it or not. So we'll buy our bees. When we first started our bee lab, we bought bees from several beekeepers in Alabama as well as in, in Georgia. And so at a certain point, now we can kind of raise our own bees because they're self-replicating. Um, and, and how they replicate is actually like producing a swarm. So the old queen, half the bees will take off. So we kind of take advantage of that and replicate our colonies as well. All right, Jeff, this was fantastic. So in the comments, I want you guys to just say thanks to our good buddy, Jeff. And I know you mentioned that you wanted to uh, give a couple of shout outs here before we, uh, before we start closing this down. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say thanks for everyone for joining. Um, hope you enjoyed being in my backyard and not at the bee lab, but I think we had just as much fun, or at least I did. And yeah, I want to give some shout outs to some of my family and friends all over the place. And so that's Avery and Parker and Hazel and Deacon and Kale and Sage and Marley and Olivia and Mia and Kuno all over the globe, actually, all staying at home, just like us here in Alabama. So I hope everyone enjoyed today and um, take care and stay safe. All right. Thank you again so much, Jeff, and to your lovely wife for being our videographer. So um, I'm going to boot you out of the stream now, but we really enjoyed that one. Um, such great information. I know that you guys are all very thankful um, for Jeff sharing this and uh, had a great um Great questions from everybody and lots of people tuning in. So now I want to tell you about some of the things that you'll find in the very first comment from us. These are to continue learning about honeybees. So you can print this off. Um, it's our coloring page. So please color that in um, and enjoy learning a little bit more about how bees help us um, pollinate and get lots of food aside from just honey. We also have our Ag Mag on there. Um, these are fun, very colorful. If you have a color printer, I have a black and white at home. So, um, but there's also a maze and then um, a way to identify um, all the different parts of bees in this. So best way to do this is to actually download it and then print it from Adobe. Another great thing that we have at the Alabama Farmers Federation, we have a brand new book that was um, written and illustrated by Laura Unger. She's one of our graphic designers, did a fantastic job with this. Um, you can uh, find the whole book 
in those links. So it's it's a great read. You'll learn a whole lot about honeybees and you'll enjoy lots of her fantastic illustrations of Miss Bonnie B. And as you see Miss Bonnie B there enjoying some ice cream, we've put a couple of recipes in there. I, this one is probably my favorite. It's ice cream in a bag. I know you're asking ice cream, why ice cream? We just talked about honeybees and honey, that's not dairy, but honey is a fantastic topping for your ice cream. So um, we just suggest that you do this ice cream in a bag activity. It's real easy and fun for your family. And then there's also a recipe from our Alabama Farmers Federation um, Farming Feeds Alabama cookbook where you can use honey and a few other ingredients to make a very good ice cream topping. I think it's on page 164. Um, created by Patty Lambrick. The recipe came from her and they are some great beekeepers over in Elmore County, actually where I'm from. So page 165 right there. And let's see, I think that's everything you guys. Thank you so very much for watching. Thanks to Jeff Williams for um, giving us this fantastic information about honeybees. And um, we hope that you guys enjoy learning more. Another, oh, I said I was finished. I'm never finished talking. <laughs> we do want you to tag us in the photos and videos of you doing some of these things about honeybees. And if you do, you could be featured in next week's um, virtual field trip, which should also be very fun because we're um, we're hoping, as long as our internet works extremely well, that we'll be with Luke and Lana Smelly, who were actually our outstanding young farm family from this past year. And we're going to learn all about catfish and how the catfish farms in Alabama and the catfish that you get from there are different than the catfish that you might catch when you go out fishing. Um, all of these field trips are also online. So if you've missed any of the other ones that we've done about peanuts, about fruit and vegetable, pr vegetable production, um, beef cattle, or if you want to rewatch any of this about honeybees, just go to that website right there. I gotta figure this out. This is a mirrored image, so it's a little weird. It's alphafarmers.org backslash virtual dash field dash trip. So, um, and all the activities are there too. And now I think it truly is time for me to stop talking. Thank you guys so much for joining us and enjoy learning even more about honeybees. Bye. <laughs>